Greetings, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. So today is the third Sunday of Lent, and Lent is a 40-day season of spiritual preparation, a time of prayer and repentance as we prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter. Today, we're going to celebrate spiritual communion. We're going to hear a reminder and a call from God to live lives of moral excellence. Uh, and my prayer is that you will encounter the presence of God in this time of worship, that you'll hear a word from God for your life, and that your commitment and your love for Christ will be strengthened and renewed. Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Father of light, in you is found no shadow or change, but only the fullness of life and limitless truth. Open our hearts to the voice of your word and free us from the original darkness that shadows our vision. Restore our sight that we may look upon your Son who calls us to repentance and to change of heart. Lord, pour your Spirit upon us as we worship you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please join me in the prayer for illumination? Let us pray. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings, and by following in his way, come to share in his glory. Send your spirit now to illuminate your holy word, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residents in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in it, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever done anything wrong that really weighed on your conscience? So when I was a kid, I lived in a neighborhood where there were a lot of other children my age, and we would go outside and we would play for you know, long stretches. I mean, sometimes we'd be out from the morning until the evening, and our parents had to kind of force us to come in at the end of the day. Uh, we played basketball, football, tag, all, all the things that kids usually do. And I admit, sometimes we got into a little bit of trouble. We played one game called Ding Dong Ditch. Do you know what that game is? It's maybe you have a different name for it, where you go up to somebody's house and you ring the doorbell, and then you run away. And, but, you know, we would stand off someplace to watch the person come to the door, ha, ha, ha. I realized you really can't play that game anymore, right? Because now everybody has ring doorbells, and so they would know, they would know who was there. But there was this one boy in our neighborhood, his name was Robert, and Robert had some developmental challenges. And uh, Robert and I would often play one-on-one -on -one together, and I liked Robert. We were friends. 
But I'll never forget a time that I was hanging out with kind of a gang of boys and Robert came around and those boys started making fun of him. And I joined in and I made fun of Robert too and I, and I teased him. Uh, and I knew it was wrong when I did it. Uh, I felt bad about it then. And there are some times where I look back and I think about those things and I, I feel bad about it now. And I, I, I don't know what happened to Robert. I really hope and I pray that he's doing well. But can you think about things like that? Can you think of things from your life that, you know, maybe you did that kind of weigh on you? Maybe they're things from your childhood. Maybe they're things that are going on in your life right now. Things that make your conscience ache. So if you can think of something like that, what I want to ask you to do is be glad. Be glad. And I'm serious. See, when God spoke to Moses, which is uh, what we're reading when we read the Ten Commandments, we're reading the words of God. Uh, When God spoke to Moses and the Jewish people, one of the ways his voice manifested was in rules and laws, in right and in wrong. Uh, That voice inside of us, that voice that knows the difference between right and wrong, the voice that recoils at hurt and pain that we cause, that is God's voice. Or at least it's the the fingerprints or the the shadow of God's voice in our human uh, conscience and heart. Uh, Now, I do want to say, it's not that voice that kind of makes you, you know, that that talks down to you or belittles you about those things. But it is the voice that points out to you and says, you know what, Uh, maybe that's not how you should behave and, and that calls you to something higher. Our God is a moral God. And God's voice is a moral voice. So here in Exodus 20, we have one of the most famous sets of God's rules and laws. And there are many, many, many of them in the scriptures, but the Ten Commandments are kind of the cornerstone of them all. Uh, Years ago, somebody gave me this uh, uh, thing called the Hillbilly Ten Commandments, and it kind of summarizes them, I think, you know, kind of in in an amusing way, Uh, but they're this, just one God, put nothing before God, no cussing. Get to Sunday meetings. Listen to your ma and your pa. No killing. No cheating on your gal. Don't t- take what ain't yours. No gossiping. Hands off your buddy's stuff. And so, again, just an, an amusing way of talking about the Ten Commandments. But these commandments all tell us something about who God is and what God wants for humanity. Uh, as a whole, God's law, including the Ten Commandments, command fidelity to God, that our relationship with God is very important. They command fairness, honesty, justice, compassion. Now, despite what we may have thought as children, or despite what some adults may think today, God's rules and laws are not intended to rob us of life, but to give us life. So can you imagine what life would be like, what the world would be like if people were just killing each other, stealing from each other, lying about each other? Well, on second thought, maybe we don't have to imagine that hard. Uh, But how about the opposite? Could you imagine what life would be like if people were united in their love and worship of God, if they were united in their love and respect for one another? The law is a gift from God that points to the heart of God. It it speaks to us of who God is and what God values. And it also points us uh, to to what a good and an abundant life looks like. So it shouldn't surprise us that when Jesus came, this is what he had to say about the law. In Matthew 5.17, he says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You know, a lot of people say, well, Jesus came now. We don't have to worry about the law anymore. But why would Jesus do that? If, if the law is partly the voice of God, it's God's call to goodness, and if it's partly showing us the way to life, why would Jesus, you know, rule out the law? He doesn't. He says, I came to fulfill the law. But then Jesus takes things in a slightly a different direction. <laughs> Uh, He says this, this is Matthew 5, 20. But I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of the heavens. 
Now listen, the scribes and the Pharisees were some of the strictest law keepers of Jesus' day. Uh, they were experts in the law. Uh, they, they had spreadsheets for the law. I mean, they, they, just, they, were, they were masters of it. Uh, they were like rule accountants or rule engineers, and no offense to accountants or engineers. And yet Jesus tells us when it comes to following him, we have to do better than them. Then Jesus goes on, uh, and this is uh, found really, this is really kind of the, 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 the whole tenor of the Sermon on the Mount. He goes on to say things like this. Uh, You've heard it was said, thou shalt not murder. Well, where did we hear that? We heard it in the Ten Commandments. Jesus says, you've heard it was said, thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, if you have anger in your heart against your brother, you're in, dangers of the fire, you're in danger of the fires of hell. He says, you've heard it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, where, where does it say that? It says it in the Ten Commandments. And Jesus goes on to say, but I tell you that if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you're guilty of adultery. He goes on to say, thou shalt not bear false witness. You've heard it was said, you know, don't, don't, don't tell lies. Well, where did we hear that? In the Ten Commandments. But he says, I say to you, yet let your yes be yes and your no be no. See, it's not enough for us just to not murder. Jesus says we are to become the kind of people who don't hate. It's not enough just to not commit adultery. Jesus says we're to become the kind of people who don't treat one another as objects of desire. It's not enough that we just don't lie. Jesus says we are to be people who live and radiate truth. So let me ask you, when you hear that description of being that kind of person, a person who doesn't have hatred, a person who doesn't objectify others, a person who speaks truth, is that something you want uh, are you tired of the hurt and the pain that you see in the world? Are you, are you tired of playing a part in that hurt yourself? Do you want to be a part of God's good and right-making in the world? Do you? Uh, do you know where all of that starts, where that begins? It begins right here, right here. Uh, and do you know how? Do you know how to begin to move in that direction of being that type of person? So we're in the season of Lent, and it's a time of self-examination, a time where we're really asked to look at our lives and ask ourselves maybe some hard truths. And so I think how we do it is we can start by looking within. We can examine our hearts and our lives. Uh, do you have a voice inside of you that's pointing you to places that need redirection, places that need healing, places that need new life? Are there things in your life that you see as harmful and you experience as harmful to yourself or to others? Learn God's law and apply it to your life in the best of your abilities. Not in an, a rigid, accountant, rule-keeping kind of way, but in a life-giving, God and other honoring kind of way. Uh, if you want to know Really, I, I encourage you to read the, the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5 through 7, which is sort of Jesus' interpretation of the Ten Commandments. Strive to be a person of moral excellence in all things. Uh, it matters. So uh, just last week, a friend of mine called me and, uh, and encouraged me to try to sign up to get a COVID uh, test someplace because word had gotten out that preachers were, uh, or clergy were invited to get a COVID test. So I went online with one of the local websites and uh, started filling out the form and filling out the information. And one of the questions that was asked is, have you been exposed to somebody who has COVID in the last 14 days? And I checked off, yes, I had been. Um, and of course, the, the, the sign-up form immediately booted me out. And, and I, I told my friend, I said, oh, I said, I couldn't sign up because it booted me out. It, it asked me this question about, uh, you know, had I been exposed to somebody in the last 14 days? And I put yes. And my friend looked kind of funny at me and said, you're so honest. <laughs> and it was, it was just kind of a funny moment. I was like, Is that, should that really be a surprise that we're so honest? Strive to be a person of moral excellence in all things. And I can tell you that that part of myself I felt much better about than the part of me that teased Robert so long ago. Most importantly, most importantly, walk with Jesus. Uh, in John 15, 4, Jesus says this, Abide in me as I abide in you. 
Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. See, through life in Christ, you and I become new creations by living life with Jesus. Through life in Christ, we seek to keep not just the bare minimum of the moral law, checking off boxes here and there, but we seek to exceed the law and become beings of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness. Uh, We become the kind of people who do what is good and right, not because it's written on a piece of paper, but because it's written on our hearts. That's who God made us to be. That's who God wants us to be. That's who we can be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.